morning, Oak Grove. And a special good morning to our guests that have joined us for today. Um, we're just, uh, we're so excited to be able to uh, host an event like this. Um, you know, it, it struck me as I was thinking about today, this last fall, we had the uh, unfortunate um, occurrence of the, the death of Dard Order. And one of the ways that we showed our respect for a guy that gave his life to Oak Grove was our choir sang at his funeral. And one of the songs, uh, one of the hymns that they sang was, This Is My Father's World. And uh, one of our parents caught me a day or two afterwards and said, what I love about Oak Grove is that we can sing that hymn. And we don't sing, this might be my father's world, or this could be my father's world. We sing, this is my father's world. And that is the privilege that we have at Oak Grove. Uh, we also have the privilege of exploring our faith as a community. And oftentimes that just involves people with uh, various perspectives and ideas that gives us hopefully an insight into our faith, maybe challenges us to think uh, perhaps in a way that we hadn't considered before. And today is that sort of event. Um, we have the privilege of having Dr. Rana here, and uh, he goes by Dr. Fuzz Rana, so you'll know him as Fuzz, and I think you're going to enjoy what he has to share with us today. And I'm guessing he's going to take us uh, down a path that perhaps some of us have never considered before, and to me that's a beautiful thing. Uh, Dr. Rana, he, oh, he uh, holds a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from what was then West Virginia State College, is now West Virginia State University, a PhD in chemistry. And um, for those of you that aspire to uh, the wonders of the scientific uh, field, uh, and this is an example of someone who's uh, taken his love and passion for that and run with it. An interesting thing about the organization that Dr. Ron is with, it's called The Reason to Believe. Um, they, I'll read you their mission. Uh, their mission is to spread the Christian gospel by demonstrating that sound reason and scientific research, including the very latest discoveries, consistently support rather than erode confidence in the truth of the Bible and faith in the personal transcendent God revealed in both scripture and nature. And oftentimes what they do in, in, uh, in that work is to engage conversation. And that's actually what we hope to do today, is to engage the mind, uh, the heart, and in the end, a conversation. So we're gonna to close today with some question and answer time. Uh, we have some adult um, uh, guests with us today, and just know that there will be time for us to engage with Dr. Rana after the students head off to, uh, to uh, their next uh, step. And for you adults, know that this is sort of a squirrely day at Oak Grove, right guys? Uh, they get off today at 1.30 because it's teacher conferences. We, let, we put on top of that an hour-long chapel, so basically they get little to no time in each of their classes, which I know they're all sad about, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's a good day. So before I introduce uh, Dr. Ron, would you just join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us as a community to be challenged by thoughts, by, by people who uh, bring a message of your love, and your creation and uh, your inspiration in our lives. So we pray your blessings today upon the message that Dr. Ron brings to us, and we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to be um, attentive and, uh, and interested in this conversation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Fuzz Ron.
at the just right time. Never, never too soon and never too late at the just right time when it's the appropriate time. And that theme is also consistent with how God works in our lives. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. That's the big picture message today. Now, um, yesterday, if you didn't know this, yesterday was Darwin Day. February 12th, every year, universities around the world celebrate Darwin's birth. And in doing so, they celebrate Darwin's life and Darwin's accomplishments, namely his, his theory of, of biological evolution. And so I was at uh, North Dakota State University yesterday speaking on the campus, offering a creationist perspective on uh, the origin and the history of life as a, a counter to um, the, the celebration that was going on honoring Darwin and his theory of evolution. Because uh, for many people, the theory of evolution represents a challenge to the Christian faith. Uh, the, the atheist and evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins once said, that Darwin's theory of evolution helps me to be an intellectually satisfied atheist. And so for many people, Darwin's theory fuels or motivates their rejection of belief in God. And so we're there on the campus, again, offering a counter perspective to Darwin's theory. But about um, four years ago, in 2009, the Darwin Day celebration that year took on, uh, a, took on a huge uh, was, was a huge celebration around the world because this was the year in which Darwin's, uh, in which we were celebrating the 150th year anniversary of the publication of On the Origin of Species, the book that Darwin wrote to present his theory of evolution, and it was also the 200th anniversary of his birth. And because of those particular anniversaries, the, the celebrations around the world were through the roof. They were over the top. And we were actually invited to write an article for Charisma magazine uh, about the Darwin Day celebration and a response to the Darwin Day celebration. And we entitled the article, What Darwin Didn't Know. And uh, that title came from uh, a press conference that Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld held in June, on June 6, 2002 uh, at NATO. And this, if you uh, remember, this was right after the tragedy of the World Trade Center uh, bombings. And um, Rumsfeld was asked about terrorist threats. And he, he made the statement that has now become somewhat humorous. At the time it wasn't, but he, was basically, he basically said this, there are things we know that we know, and there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we do not know. And so the three categories are we know what we know, we know what we don't know, but the worst category of all, which is frightening when you think about terrorism threats, but it's also frightening when you think about uh, this category and other aspects of life as well, and it's the things that you don't know that you don't know that are always the problems. And the, the, the question that we asked in the article was, if Darwin knew then what we know now about biology, would he have advanced his theory of evolution? Because Darwin's theory of evolution now is about 155 years old. And over that course of time, everything that we know today that constitutes modern biology has been discovered since Darwin's theory of evolution. And so what we know about the origin and the history of life and the nature of life, the nature of inheritance, the whole shebang was discovered after Darwin proposed his theory of evolution. And what I'm going to argue today is that what we know about the origin and the history of life in this particular instance is contrary to what you'd expect if Darwin's theory was true. And again, the question is, if Darwin knew these things, then would he have advanced his theory of evolution? And if you're interested, you can actually get an expanded version of that article in the little booklet that we wrote called What Darwin Didn't Know. That's a companion piece to, to that you know, article in Charisma. Now, in the book, Origins of Species, where again Darwin presents his theory of evolution, um, Darwin uh, did something that every good scientist does. A good scientist, when he proposes a theory, 
will actually not only look for ways to demonstrate that his theory is valid, he will also look for ways to falsify his theory. He will actually suggest ways in which his theory could be proven wrong. And Darwin actually did that. He had uh, a couple of chapters devoted to what he considered to be problems for his theory. And one of the problems that Darwin had was a certain feature of the fossil record. And this is what Darwin wrote. There is another and allied difficulty which is much more serious. I allude to the manner in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. To the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. So what Darwin basically was noting is that in the geological record there is this layer that was called the Cambrian layer. And this is after an area in England, a, a camp known as Cambria. And so this is called the Cambrian layer uh, of the geological record. And in that record, you see these fossils for animals. All kinds of different animal fossils are found in the Cambrian layer. But if you go right beneath that layer, which presumably represents an earlier time in Earth's history, you see no fossils whatsoever. And what Darwin expected was that he would see relatively simple uh, uh, animals that became increasingly complex and increasingly diversified in a tree-like manner that would lead up to the Cambrian time frame. But instead of seeing that, it's like the animals were just there and there wasn't anything beneath this. And this didn't make any sense to Darwin in light of his theory of evolution that again expected a gradual evolutionary change of life throughout Earth's history. This problem that Darwin recognized in the fossil record is still a problem today, 150 years later. Simon Conway Morris, who is one of the world's leading experts in the Cambrian fossils, wrote, th wrote this. William Buckland knew about it. I don't know who William Buckland is, sorry. Charles Darwin characteristically agonized over it and still we do not fully understand it. It, of course, is the seemingly abrupt appearance of animals in the Cambrian explosion. So what is the Cambrian explosion? Well, the Cambrian explosion is an event that is recorded in the fossil record that dates at about 540 million years ago, where 50 to 80 percent of the animal phyla that have ever existed on Earth show up in, an, in a geological instant. And this is a marine event. These are animals that would have existed in the Earth's oceans. Now, let me, let me pause for a minute here. Um, I know that there, when it comes to the question of origins, uh, there are Christians who hold a variety of different perspectives on, on the issue of origins. Uh, some Christians would argue that day in Genesis should be 24 hours, a 24-hour period, uh, period of time. And therefore, you're looking at six consecutive days that comprise the creation week, and, and that the earth is six to 10,000 years old. There are other Christians like me who would say day is a period of time, and therefore that, that the age of the earth and the age of the universe and the age of the history of life on earth in the order of millions and millions of years is not troubling or, or concerning. And that, again, that's the particular view that I hold. Now, I know, again, Christians who hold the young earth perspective. I know Christians who hold an old earth perspective. And, and the, the Christians that I know are committed followers of Jesus Christ who just simply have different convictions when it comes to how do you read Genesis 1 and how then do you relate Genesis 1 to the scientific record. And so if you hold to what's known as a young earth position this morning, I'm not here to convince you to change your viewpoint to my position. I'm just simply going to share with you my perspective on the Cambrian explosion and how it relates to Genesis 1 and what does it mean in a broader sense with, the, with regard to the question of origins. And so even if you hold to a young earth view, I think there are things that I have to say that still would be interesting to you and valuable to you. And again, 
Uh, and if nothing else, hopefully you can understand a little bit better where our Earth creation has come from. So I'm not here to change anybody's mind. I'm just simply here to lay out my perspective on this issue. Now, so the Cameron explosion here is this event that Darwin knew about and that, again, is a feature of the fossil record today. Again, it is something that Darwin agonized about. And the reason why he agonized about it, again, because it didn't match his expectations with regard to his theory of evolution. And this is, again, called the Cambrian Explosion. And the reason why it's called the Cambrian Explosion is it's an incredibly dramatic uh, uh, event in life's history where the, the level of biological innovation is, again, through the roof. It's almost unimaginable. It's so extensive and so dramatic. And what I want to do in the next few minutes is give you a sense for how dramatic the Cambrian Explosion is. And the first thing that we have to talk about is what a phylum is. Because I said 50 to 80 percent of the animal phyla that have ever existed show up in the Cambrian Explosion. So what is a phylum? Who in here knows what a phylum is? All right, some of you do. If, 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 if you take biology, you learn about the Linnaean system of classification and the different levels of categories in biological classification. There's species and, and then groups of species that are the same belong to a genus and genera that are, the same, that are similar belong to a family, and so on and so forth. Well, a phylum is very close to the top of that hierarchy of categories. And a phylum actually turns out to be a, a category that defines what biologists call the organism's body plan. If you, if you think of the body plan being like the blueprints for the organism, so when, a, when somebody's going to build a building, they get an architect who designs the building on paper. And so the body plan is kind of like the architectural design of the organism. And biologists identify four important parameters that define a body plan. This is, is symmetry, cephalization, metamorphism, and, and body cavities. And we'll explain what each of these are in a minute. Symmetry describes the organism's um, the, the relationship of the different parts of the organism. So we, the simplest way to, to understand that is to think about the type of symmetry that we display. We display what's called bilateral symmetry. That's a, a word that you, or that you, or a term that you want to remember. It simply means that if you took an imaginary plane and you sliced our bodies in half, right at the midline, our left and our right sides are in effect mirror images of each other. That's what bilateral symmetry is. And this is the most common type of symmetry that you see uh, in, in, among biological organisms. There's another form of symmetry called radial symmetry. And there, if you take an imaginary plate and you slice the organism in half, no matter what the direction is, you get basically the same uh, structures on both sides. That's called radial symmetry. Cephalization is whether or not the organism has a head region. Of course, we, we display cephalization, at least some of us display cephalization. Some of us have a head region. Uh, it's supposed to be a joke, but obviously uh, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, but, but some organisms don't have a head, and other organisms do. And then there's something called metamorphism, and the earthworm is the, the example extraordinaire for metamorphism. It just simply means repeating units that make up the body. So an earthworm has those little segments that make up its body. And in fact, a lot of organisms display metamorphism. Things like insects display metamorphism. What happens is those units actually get fused together to make larger units. And so an insect has a thorax and an abdomen and a head region. And these are actually formed from these units that are fused together. We actually display metamorphism. If you think of our, our spinal cord, or not our spinal cord, but our, verte or our backbone, the vertebrae, each vertebrae represents a metameric unit that's repeated over and over and over again along the length of our spine. And then there's uh, body cavity. Uh, there, there's two different types of body cavities. You see there's one with a single opening and one with a dual opening. We have what's called a tube within a tube body design. So the idea is that if you put these different characteristics together in different ways, you can wind up with a wide variety of architectural designs. 
And so what you see in the Cambrian explosion is not an explosive appearance of species that are similar to each other or genera or families or orders. What you see is the explosive appearance of all these different body plans, all these different architectural designs. And so it's an incredibly dramatic event when you talk about the origin of phylum. And again, because it's so dramatic, uh, it's referred to as not only the Cambrian explosion, but sometimes as biology's Big Bang or evolution's Big Bang. Again, connoting just how dramatic an event it is. Now, a little bit more on this. One of the things that happens in the Cambrian explosion is that animals appear that have skeletons. So this is the first time that you see animals in the history of life on Earth, and this is the first time that you see skeletal designs. And it turns out that there's a whole bunch of different types of skeletons that can exist. Just like there's a whole bunch of different body plans, there's a whole bunch of different types of skeletons that can exist. And these skeletons consist, again, of a number of different properties. They can be internal, we have an internal skeleton. They can be external, like an insect, as an exoskeleton. Uh, they can be rigid, we have a rigid skeleton. They can be flexible, like a shark that has a, a, a flexible skeleton made of cartilage. They can consist of one element, like a, a, a snail, or two elements, like a clam, or multiple elements. They can consist of uh, uh, rods and plates and three-dimensional solids. They can grow by a variety of ways. They can be made of, of a variety of materials. And it turns out that scientists have actually figured out how many conceivable skeletal designs can exist in biology, and it turns out about 210. And in the Cambrian explosion, 180 different skeletal designs appear. Again, almost instantaneously. When it comes to the Cambrian explosion, we see, for the first time, ecosystems coming into existence. And these ecosystems are fully developed and fully established as soon as they appear, as soon as the Cambrian animals appear in the fossil record. And they look just like modern day marine ecosystems. And again, this dramatic event has no explanation whatsoever. Kevin Peterson, one of the world's leading experts in the Cambrian explosion, said this, although the Cambrian uh, explosion is of singular importance to our understanding of the history of life, it continues to defy explanation, again, from an evolutionary standpoint. The Cambrian explosion represents, in my mind, one of the most significant challenges to biological evolution. Charles Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species, the abrupt manner in which whole groups of species suddenly appear in certain formations has been urged by several paleontologists as a fatal objection to the belief in the transmutation of species. That's another way of saying the, evo to the evolutionary model, to his theory of evolution. Again, Darwin recognized that the Cameron explosion is problematic, and other scientists in his day pointed out this very feature. Now, specifically, why is the Cambrian explosion such a problem for the evolutionary paradigm? Well, first of all, instead of seeing an evolutionary tree, we see what's called an, an, an evolutionary law. So instead of seeing, again, a history of life on Earth where we have simple organisms that become more complex and diversified in a branching tree-like manner, we see Everything's showing up all at once. And, and instead of a tree, it's what's referred to as an evolutionary law, where things just, again, show up simultaneously. This is not what you would expect, as you saw in Darwin's state. It also is a problem because it's evolution happening in the wrong direction. It's supposed to be the origin of species, and then genera, and then families, and on and on. But instead, you see the origin of phyla first, so it's evolution happening upside down. That, again, doesn't make any sense. And then also, it happens in an incredibly rapid period of time. Now, to get a feeling for how rapid that period of time is, I'd like for you to think about Earth's history, again, from an old Earth perspective. Think about Earth's history in the context of a football field. So Earth, life has been present on Earth some scientists believe as far back as 3.8 million years. 
So if you take 100 yards as being equal to 3.8 million years, life begins at your own goal line, and you'd have to drive the ball almost 85 yards down the field inside the 20-yard line before the Cambrian explosion would happen. Almost 85% of life's history transpires before the Cambrian explosion. And throughout that time, the only kind of organisms present on Earth are single-celled organisms. There's no evidence for anything that's much more complex than that. And then when the Cambrian explosion happens, boom, animals appear out of nowhere. And the duration of that is more narrow than a hash mark on a football field. Now, in case you're wondering what football game that was, this is uh, a football game that was played in 2004 at Langley Field in Charleston, West Virginia, where the high school that I went to, Polka High School, was playing this for the state championship, and they happened to win that game. Uh, and that was a back-to-back -back victory, so they won the championship in 2003 and 2004. And the high school that I went to it was is Polka High School. And I bet you can't guess what our mascot was. We, are the, we were the polka dots. <laughs> so, all I'm going to say is you should be very grateful that your school is named Oak Grove. <laughs> True story. And just so you know, that the guy that was inside that suit is still going to counsel. <laughs> okay. Now, Darwin also was concerned, again, about the Cambrian explosion and wrote these words as well in Origins of Species. Again, along the same lines as the concerns that I've spoken about earlier. If numerous species belonging to the same genera or families have really started into life all at once, that fact would be fatal to the theory of descent and slow modification through natural selection. For the development of a group of forms, all which had descended from some progenitor, must have been an extremely slow process, and the progenitors must have lived long ages before their modified descendants. So again, um, if things show up simultaneously in the fossil record, Darwin argued, that is a real problem. And when you actually <coughs> drill down into the details of what's going on in the Cameron explosion, you see again this pattern, this troubling pattern time and time again. And let me give you an example. With something known as deuterostone origins. This is what's so fun about science is you get all these wonderful, wonderful terms that you can utilize. Um, there are two main groups of animals, deuterostomes and protostomes. Okay, protostomes would be organisms like insects and mollusks and, uh, and, and, worm, and, and earthworms and things like that. Those are protostomes. And then deuterostomes would be uh, creatures like us. This is the group that we belong to. And, and I, as a rule, I, 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 a rule of thumb, I only eat uh, deuterostomes. I don't eat protostomes because protostomes are just really gross. <laughs> okay? But some people like protostomes, not me. So that'd be like shrimp and lobster and mollusks and scallops and things like that. As a rule, I don't eat anything from that particular group. But uh, de uh, uh, deuterostomes, again, are a very important group that includes, uh, includes us. And we belong to a phylum called Chordata. Were chordates. And so people are interested in understanding the origin of chordates because these represent some of the most important organisms on our planet. It includes uh, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And we, we are, we're a mammal. And so evolutionary biologists believe that a group of Organisms called echinoderms. Echinoderms would be creatures like sea stars and sea cucumbers. Gave rise to two branches, hemichordates. These are a very, uh, a very small. This is a very small phylum that includes things like acorn worms, and then gave rise to uh, the phylum chordate, chordata, and that the phylum chordata, as one of its major groups, are vertebrates. 
And so the first vertebrates would, would be jawless vertebrates. These are called the agnathans. And then within cord the chordata phylum, you have what are called urochordates and cephalochordates as major groups. And so from an evolutionary perspective, this is what they think happened. Yet when you look at the Cameron explosion, everything shows up simultaneously. So again, this is just another example of things showing up simultaneously. Now, what did Darwin do with this problem? Well, this is what Darwin did. He basically argued that the fossil record is incomplete and that our collections of animals from the fossil record is incomplete. Darwin argued, oh, well, let's just look at his words, that our paleontological collections are very imperfect is admitted by everyone. In other words, Darwin said in his day, paleontology was just beginning as a discipline, and people hadn't done a very good job of collecting fossils. And so Darwin argued when those fossils were found, these missing links, if you will, would actually be discovered. He also said this, we continually overrate the perfection of the geological record and falsely infer because certain genera or families have not been found beneath a certain stage that they did not exist before that stage. He also said, we continually forget how large the world is compared with the area over which our geological foundations have been carefully examined. And so Darwin basically said, hey, the Cambrian explosion might have explanation when, when we collect more fossils. We'll find those missing fossils. Well, again, as I mentioned earlier, the Cambrian explosion looks like this is the way it is. And this is based on some incredible fossil finds that we now have documenting the Cambrian explosion. This includes the Burgess Shale in the Canadian Rockies. There are two very important sites there, known as the Walcott Formation and the Stevens Formation. And just a few days ago, researchers published the discovery of another site in the Canadian Rockies documenting the Burgess Shale. So there's now three sites, and these are called Lagerstaden, it, it, which is German for the mother lobe. And so they, these sites are, are just uh, are, are over, overloaded with fossil remains. They're just huge numbers of fossil remains in these sites that give us an unbelievable window into life at that time, and again, the Cameron explosion. But there's also a very important site in China, the Shenzhen site, as well as a site in Greenland. And all of these sites tell the same story, the explosive appearance of animals, the explosive appearance of phyla, just demonstrating an incredible diversity of, of organisms. In addition to that, we now have evidence for fossils that existed prior to the Cambrian explosion. These are called the Ediacaran uh, organisms, and these are multicellular organisms, but nobody knows what they are. They surely don't have any connection to animals that appear in the Cambrian explosion. So you can't argue that the fossil record is complete because we have all these Cambrian sites around the world that demonstrate the reality of the Cambrian explosion, and we now know what, what happened prior to the Cambrian explosion, and again, it's essentially single-celled organisms and that there's a little bit of something going on before the Cambrian that are multicellular animals that, again, nobody understands, but don't surely relate it at all to the animals in the Cambrian explosion. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about why I believe the Cambrian explosion is, a, is really a problem for Darwin's theory of evolution. And given the things that Darwin wrote, I think it's fair to ask if Darwin really knew then, what we know now about the Cambrian explosion, would he have advanced his theory of evolution? Because when he wrote The Origin of Species, he wrote about this being a real problem for his theory. Let's shift gears now and talk about this in the context of creation. Because for me, when I look at the Cambrian explosion, I would argue that not only is it a, a problem for the theory of evolution, it represents in my mind powerful evidence that God must have been responsible for life's history. And this to me looks like a creation event. In fact, it looks like a creation event even to evolutionary biologists who are atheists. This is what Richard Dawkins wrote, who's a well-known evolutionary biologist and an outspoken atheist. 
He said this, the Cambrian strata of rocks vintage about 600 million years are the oldest ones which we find most of the major invertebrate groups, and we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It's as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. It's real interesting. It looks like a creation event. And in fact, when I think about the Cambrian explosion in light of the Genesis 1 creation account, it reminds me of the fifth day of creation where God commands the waters to teem with life. And if you wanted to see something scientifically that would match that, that, that declaration, let the waters teem with life, I would immediately think of the Cambrian explosion. Because again, these are all marine animals that appear in the Cambrian explosion. It's, it's incredibly remarkable. So, the Cambrian explosion stands as a significant challenge to the theory of evolution. It provides evidence for creation, and it also provides us evidence for the scientific reliability of Genesis 1. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time showing how Genesis 1 matches the scientific record in the context of the Cambrian explosion. And as I do that, I'm going to now also ask the question, why did God wait so long to create animal life? And as we ask this question, we're not only going to again see the scientific accuracy of Genesis 1, we're going to see something that actually tells us about how God works in our lives as Christians. Now, as I mentioned, I'm an old earth creationist, and I hold to a view that's called day-age creation. I'm a, a day-age creationist. And, and what I do, as part of my work at Reasons to Believe, is I try to find the correspondence between the scientific record and the Genesis 1 creation account. And so here is a, a, a quick overview of what I think is going on on the different days of creation from a scientific perspective. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. I look at this as being the beginning of the universe. Uh, Genesis 1.2 gives us a description of the earth in its primordial state. The first day of creation is describing the transformation of the atmosphere, so sunlight reaches the surface of the planet. So as the earth rotates, we now have day and night, a light-dark cycle. Day three is the formation of the water cycle, where the waters above are separated from the waters below. Uh, so, sorry, day two. Day three is the formation of the continents and the, the animal, or sorry, the plants on the continents. Day four is another event where the atmosphere is transformed, so that you now are able to see, uh, if you were a hypothetical observer on the Earth at that time, you're now able to see the heavenly bodies. And then day five would be, uh, oops, day five would be the Cambrian explosion and the, the creation of uh, fish and mammals in the in the uh, oceans and birds. And then day six is the creation of uh, animals on the land and human beings. Now, the question then is, why why animal life so late, and how does the Cambrian explosion? fit into, again, the Genesis 1 account. Well, in order for animals, this is something that scientists have discovered, in order for animals to exist on our planet, the ocean has to have chemistry that is conducive for advanced life. And when the Earth's oceans were initially formed, they were very acidic. Okay, they have, and, 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 and an acidic ocean would be corrosive. And so you had to have basically a transformation of the ocean from being acidic to being more neutral in terms of its acidity. And it turns out that the continents, when they formed, actually created uh, materials that could then erode into the Earth's ocean. And as they eroded and entered into the Earth's ocean, they actually altered the pH from being acidic to being neutral, making an environment where animals could live. In addition to that, even though you have animals that live in the ocean, these animals that live in the ocean have to be, can't be very deep, typically. They've got to be closer to the surface, which means when the continents form, they create a continental shelf and a, and, and a continental slope where complex animals can exist. The continents also create shallow water environment 
environments that allow for cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic bacteria, to exist. These bacteria generate oxygen, which provides the oxygen needed at high enough levels in the atmosphere for these animals to breathe. So scientists have discovered that the Cambrian explosion couldn't have happened any earlier in Earth's history than when it happened, because the Earth wasn't ready to accommodate advanced life. We also need continents and erosion products from the continents to deposit materials in the Earth's ocean that could be used to build the skeletons that these animals in the Cambrian explosion had. So what's interesting to me in light of the Genesis 1 account is that Moses, who I believe wrote Genesis 1 and was divinely inspired by God as he wrote Genesis 1, uh, actually places the Cambrian explosion, or what I believe to be referring to the Cambrian explosion, in the right place in the creation week. Because when you look at Genesis 1, the earth in its initial condition is a water world. Well, why wouldn't God create animals right at the very beginning if the earth is a water world, if these are all animals that existed in the earth's oceans? But instead, what you see described in the text is that continents form first, and then animals are created after the continents have been formed. And again, we now know that that makes sense, scientifically speaking. And what it's telling us, if we think about God the Creator, who's also God the Redeemer, is that God was waiting until the conditions of the earth were just right. That God was working, I believe, to prepare the earth so that when the time was right, he could create these advanced life forms on the planet on the fifth day of creation. That God, again, operated at the appropriate time, not sooner and not later, but when the time was just right. And what's interesting is, you see that this is also how God is described as his work, uh, is with regard to his work as Redeemer. That he never does things before the appropriate time. And have a... 2.3, the prophet writes, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Or the apostle Paul writes to the church of Galatia, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. And so what the Bible is telling us is that God waits for the appointed time. That what God is going to do, he will do when the time is right. And that we need to be patient, as the prophet Habakkuk encouraged us, to be patient. To be patient. And so this applies to our lives as well. That when we look at the history of life on earth and the Cameron explosion, not only is it very powerful evidence for God's work as creator, but it's telling us that, again, again, God takes his time, and when the time is right, God will act, and he will act in a dramatic way. When it comes to the history of redemption, God takes his time, and when the time is right, he acted in a dramatic way, where the Lord Jesus Christ comes to earth uh, to carry out his ministry and, his, and his, his role as redeemer. And when we think about God working in our lives, we need to be patient as we pray to God, as we seek God, uh, because we, and we need to be confident that God will act, but he's going to act at the appropriate time. And if he acted too soon, then it's not going to be as good as, as when he acts, when he chooses to act. We have to have confidence that that is indeed the right time. Anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, I'm happy at this point to take questions, but thank you so much for your attention this morning. Stand up and be loud so everybody can hear you. Uh, what is your opinion on the apparent evolutionary process that occurred after the Cambrian explosion? Did everybody hear that question? What is my opinion of the apparent evolutionary processes that happened after the Cambrian explosion? I'm of the view, I, I'm a skeptic of the evolutionary paradigm. Now, uh, when it comes to evolution, I think, for example, things like microevolution are 
are well established. And that the example would be the peppered moth changing wing color from light to dark and dark to light as the amount of soot from pollution in the environment varied on the, on the landscape. Or uh, speciation, I don't have a big problem with where like the Galapagos finches arise from an ancestral finch that made its way to the island. These are, again, uh, essentially processes where organisms are able to adapt to their environment. And I actually see that as evidence for design and for God's providence, where organisms are created in a way that they are robust and can adapt to, again, their environment. Or bacteria acquiring antibiotic resistance, no big deal with, with that. But when it comes to the origin of life, where we're saying that life can come from non-life, chemicals can self-organize, I'm a profound skeptic at that point and think there's tremendous scientific problems, and also with things like macroevolution. And so when I look at the fossil record, I see a real history of life on Earth, but I believe it's a history of life on Earth that is incompatible with the evolutionary paradigm. The Cambrian explosion is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the ways in which the fossil record, I believe, are incompatible with Darwin's theory. Because instead of seeing a whole <coughs> bunch of transitional forms, we see a dearth of transitional intermediates in the fossil record. Things show up and they remain static. They don't undergo evolutionary transformation. Uh, and then whenever there's innovation, it happens explosively. So in addition to the Cambrian explosion, we have radiation, what are called radiation events, explosive diversification for fish. We see it for amphibians. We see it for reptiles, three times for birds and for mammals. And even when human beings appear on the scene, we see something else that explosively happens, and that's the appearance of sophisticated uh, advanced cognitive behavior that I believe reflects the image of God. So I see the history of life on Earth as being basically a, a history orchestrated by God where God is intervening. I don't want to see it as being compatible with, uh, with evolution. Anybody else? Yes, right here. Speak up, sir. Yes. Okay, the Cambrian explosion was a marine event is there the equivalent on the land? Uh, the answer to that is uh, yes. There's again something known as the amphibian radiation. Uh, so shortly after amphibians uh, appear on the land, there's this massive radiation event. It's not nearly as dramatic as the Cambrian explosion because there you're dealing with the radiation of a particular class of, of, of chordates. Whereas with the Cameron explosion, you're dealing with the dramatic appearance of different phyla. But yes, there's some, it's not quite as dramatic, but there is still that radiation event. You also see it, again, with reptiles and birds. So, but those are not all at once. They are, they are separated in time. But they still are, are dramatic events. Anybody else? Questions? Oh, yes, right here. Sorry. And, and the question here is about the biblical flood playing a role in layering the, the geological record and, and the fossil record. And, and that would be a, a position that would be consistent with a young earth creationist position. So I, I don't look at the flood as being responsible for the geological record or the fossil record. I view that as reflecting a real history of life on earth. So I would take a, a different view on that. But there are Christians who take a young earth perspective we would argue that the, the, the fossil record and the geological record was due to a global flood. So that's, that, those are just different perspectives or different models. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, this is a big room. <laughs> it's hard to see. Anybody else have a question? Okay, yes. So thanks. I have a hard time seeing so. The seven days of creation, uh, do you view them as periods of time? Do you view them as all the same period of time? Or Okay, so the question is, do I view the days as periods of time, as equivalent periods of time? And, and uh, my answer to that is no. I think of them as periods of time, but they can be variable. And I, I view the, the days of creation as being kind of like the highlights of what God did as creator. That it's not giving us an exhaustive description, 
but it's just giving us highlights, uh, key events that, uh, that the Creator was involved in. And I believe that when we study the record of nature, we see even more evidence for God's work as Creator. So Genesis 1 gives us an overview, and as we study the record of nature, we even get to see more and more evidence of what God has done. It may not be mentioned in the Bible, but it's still, um, because I look at, at creation as being, again, part of God's revelation as well. And so we, when we study creation, we're studying uh, another revelation from God that should be compatible with Scripture, but may actually give us unique insight into God's work as creator. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. How, how, how do people know that there's only single cell organisms? Yeah. Okay, before the Cambrian explosion, by looking at the fossil record. And, and, and believe it or not, um, bacteria, as small as they are, will actually leave behind fossils. And so paleontologists are very skilled at, at discovering these, these incredibly microscopic fossils. But when you look at, again, um, rock formations that predate the Cambrian, you do see, do see fossils, but they're of single cell organisms. Let's see, anybody else have a question? <coughs> oh, okay, yes, sir. Russ, I know you're aware of it. Uh, how do you respond to uh, some of the revisions in Darwinism that are currently taught, such as uh, the punctuated equilibrium that you and Jay formulated to partly account for the absence of transition fossils in the fossil record? And how do you respond to the genetic information that shows that rather continuous Right. Yeah, great questions. Um, so the first question was how do I respond to some of the more recent developments in evolutionary theory, like punctuated equilibrium of Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould and, and another paleontologist by the name of Niles Eldridge in the, I believe, late 70s, early 80s, advanced this idea known as punctuated equilibrium. I think actually it might have been the early um, and they're, they're, what they were basically saying is that when we look at the fossil record, the fossil record, which shows sudden appearances of new groups followed by stasis, and then again, uh, new groups suddenly appearing, is actually the real pattern of life's history. So the reason we're not seeing gradualism is because gradualism is not a, a, a pattern that describes life's, life's history. Now I see punctuated equilibrium as being the, the same type of pattern I would expect if a creator is responsible for orchestrating life's history. Now, what's interesting is Gould and Eldridge never really have been able to come up with any kind of mechanism that actually that actually accounts for punctuated equilibrium. So you've got a, a model that describes the fossil record, but there's not really a mechanism that undergirds it. The mechanism that you would expect uh, from a genetic standpoint would be gradualism. And, and so gradualism has a mechanism, but it doesn't match the fossil record. So, you know, I don't see punctuated equilibrium as being problematic at all, or, or being a legitimate explanation. It's essentially an admission the fossil record is, uh, the, way, the way it is, is a, is a real pattern for life's history. And it doesn't match, again, the expectation of gradualism. Um, and the, the next question was, what about the genetic similarities of organisms that she, seem to show continuity? And in fact, this was the topic of my lecture last night at NDSU. And um, the um, <clears throat> kind of the short answer, we can talk more in detail if you'd like. The short answer is when you see shared features that organisms possess, whether it's anatomical or genetic, uh, one argument would be those shared features reflect an evolutionary history, where the common ancestor had those features and as that population created divergent lineages, uh, those lineages retain those, those features. So it reflects common descent in evolutionary history. Another way to look at it is that those shared features reflect common design as opposed to common descent. And it's interesting that prior to Darwin, there was a biologist named Sir Richard Owen, who was a, a preeminent biologist in his day. He actually was so such a prominent scientist that his name was spoken in the same breath as Isaac Newton's. He was an incredibly important biologist. 
You actually, as the father of comparative anatomy, you came up with certain concepts on homology, you coined the term dinosaur. He was a, he was a theist, and his approach to homology, which again he discovered, was that this represented an archetypical design that existed in the mind of the first cause that was essentially manifested. And so you could look at shared features as reflecting common design as opposed to common descent. And some of the genetic features that people that are shared that people have argued are junk DNA uh, turn out actually to be, we're now discovering that junk DNA actually has function. So there, my point being, you could actually look at that data from a design friendly or a creation friendly framework and make just make equivalent sense of it as you could from an evolutionary framework. Let me see the other question. Any questions over here? Yes. Sorry. What what do I believe about what would have happened before creation? Uh, well, I, I believe that, um, and this is really a theological question, I'm just a biochemist, so. Um, if, if I look at what scripture teaches and what theologians discuss, I think before creation you essentially had the Holy Trinity in communion, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in, in communion, and that, uh, that God is eternal, but it was in this eternal love relationship with the three members of the Trinity, and that God existed, but there was not a created order. For, for you theologians, hopefully that was a good answer. If not, I, I apologize. By the way, uh, um, one, one quick uh, comment. Whenever somebody speaks about science faith issues, um, I think you always need to adopt the attitude of the Bereans where you need to check everything out. And so, I've said things to you today that I sincerely believe are true, but I very well could be wrong on some of these issues. Or there, and there's other people who have differing perspectives. And so I would really encourage you not to just accept what I say, or accept what anybody says, but actually put the, forth the effort to think about it, to study it on your own, and to check it out and to confirm uh, what, what that, that person is espousing. So the hard work really is your responsibility. So if I give an answer or say things that you're not comfortable with, you don't have to accept it, uh, but I would encourage you to check it out to see if what I'm saying has validity or not. There's one more question. We, we should uh, oh. we should probably end this part of it, and let's do that with a resounding thank you for Dr. Next on your strange day. And we'll go into the